My name is Lynn Harris Ballen, and this Gorilla Read is actually part of the first annual Lambda Lit Fest in LA. Today is the grand finale day. And I'm going to be reading something from a book in progress that I'm working on, and it's partly set in South Africa where I grew up. And this is what I call a fragment. My father was a revolutionary, you know. I wonder how much of it is in my genes. I've tried to feel around inside myself, <clears throat> run a mental fingertip over an individual gene and feel the pattern and see if all the helixes are in the right places. Maybe one swirls off like a spiral staircase going nowhere. I once saw one like that. I walked into a house and there it was a wrought iron spiral smack in the middle of the living room. Everyone acted as if it was a perfectly ordinary piece of suburban furniture and they used the bottom stair as a seat, which just proves you can get used to anything. The problem with my father is that I can't get a feel for him. I try to picture him driving red dirt roads across the felt outside Johannesburg the back seat of his car piled up with Liberal Party pamphlets and papers that he graded for his students. The teacher's training college was maybe just a cluster of washed green prefab buildings with a few dusty blue gum trees around. Did he think about the explosives as he drove? Did they call to him like sirens tempting sailors to a deceptive shore? One of his friends had hidden them in a closet at Witz, the white university. They must have sat there quite innocently, hidden behind out-of-date textbooks and piles of departmental letterhead. I graduated from that same university 18 years later. Maybe I walked past that closet on my way to Politics 101 classes. I didn't feel any tug on my jeans pulling me towards it, but I felt the political tide dragging at my feet. At student rallies in the University Great Hall, when I joined in the Zulu battle cry of the ANC, call and response to Amandla, power, we roared our answer, Awetu, to the people. But my father was caught in his own tide his underground group had already dwindled to four when those left heard rumors of their impending arrests. The first man headed north over the border. I found out that he later became a left-wing TV producer in the north of England. The second one was arrested the next morning. He spent 10 years in jail for conspiracy. And when he was released, he wrote a book about it, all of it including the torture. But my father woke that Friday morning to the gunpowder singing seductive songs of grand explosions and blows for freedom. There were just two of the group left. He and a third guy chose two targets for the maximum publicity value, Johannesburg Station and the main post office. But at 4.05 p.m., when he drove into the station parking lot, his brother in arms had already been arrested and he told everything and turned state's evidence eventually. The concourse of Johannesburg station has a kind of grimy grandeur. Once white marble floors are worn by commuting feet. And my father chose to place the suitcase on platform four whites only trains for the West Rand dormitory towns left from there. It must have felt familiar. That's where he would have caught a train home if he was so inclined. And a luggage tag was tied to the suitcase. The Sunday papers quoted the Afrikaans message on it, written back in five minutes. So I try to imagine the bomb did it have an alarm clock counting the minutes snug inside the brown suitcase in front of the wooden slatted seat on platform four? 
Did the ticking comfort him as he carried that suitcase? Like a ticking clock comforts a kitten when it's just left its mother? Or did the voice of the gunpowder reach a crescendo right then? At 4.18, he phoned the railway police and the Daily Mail newspaper. The bomb was said to explode at 4.33. But he'd seen an evacuation drill at the station once, and all the platforms had cleared in five minutes with one blaring intercom message, in both official languages, of course. The newspaper called the security police. And how the security police must have grinned at this foolish idealist. They just sat back and waited, waited to turn the tide their way. See, they would say, see how violent and ungrateful these white radicals are. How can you expect us to negotiate with those who kill old women, maim small children? We must fight them to the bitter end. And my father, he sang, we shall overcome on his way to the gallows eight months later.